Welcome to Crush Gasm, the podcast dedicated to the highs and some lows of crushes. From their first to their worst, we're going to cover them all with a cascade of characters, including our guest today, one of my best Twitter friends, Leave Nelson B, a musician, black nerd, and self proclaimed complainer who's continuously dropping delights. He's here today to chat about a few celebrities that have managed to catch his eye since he was a wee teenager. Two of them, I'm like, okay, I get, and one of them, well, I have questions about leave Nelson B. How are you? I'm doing. I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. My back is hurting, but I'm other than that, I'm doing fantastic. It's a beautiful day out today. It's actually my first time hearing your voice. So. Yeah, I know. It sounds like Minnie Mouse. I know. <laughs> I know I'm very cartoonish. <laughs> Don't let it distract you. Oh no, no. I- like, uh, we, we, we get along pretty well, I think. So. <laughs> so, when you sent over your celebrity crush list, there was three. Three very different women. Women so different from one another on the surface that I would not say they went together in terms of being one's type. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, if my closest friends saw a group of guys lined up, they could totally tell which ones I'd be into. But for you, I was like, that's such an array. Um, have you always been like that? Like a variety of different type of women catching your eye? Um, I think, I, I think it just like goes into what I'm attracted to. And I think it's more of a, like, like how you carry yourself type of thing, as opposed to, you know, like, oh, she's got a big ass or something like that. You know what I mean? I like big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> So let's talk about these celebrity crushes. They are the iconic Shaka Khan, the actress turned pro poker player Jennifer Tilly, and the Oscar winner Miss Bridget Jones herself, Renee Zellweger. Can you tell us when each of these women kind of became your crush? Uh, Jennifer Tilly when I was uh, younger, way younger, when I first saw Liar Liar for the first time. And she had like the pixie cut blonde hair and everything. Oh. Yeah, I think it was her voice that caught me. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's that's what really, really counted was her, her voice. I am so grateful I have an attorney I can trust. Yeah. So, like, I, I can tell when Jennifer Tilly is, like, voice acting, like, really, like, really quickly. Like, she was a mother in Stuart Little at the end of the movie. Oh, was she? Was she a mouse? Yeah, she was a mouse. Oh, I never yeah. saw it. <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of a perfect role for her, but yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, Jennifer, T- uh, J- funny thing about Jennifer Tilly is that when I enlisted in the Air Force and I got, I was in England and, uh, I was talking to my best friend, you know, I think we were texting and I, and I think I, if you're in a, I, I told him if he was ever in a position, you know, to bag uh, Jennifer Tilly, like <laughs> I call transatlantic dibs <laughs> on, on that one. But yeah, yeah, I mean, and yeah, Jennifer Tilly was definitely like one of my earliest, you know, like actual human being celebrity crushes. You know, I think we all had crushes on like cartoons, like the, like Penny from Inspector Gadget or some shit like that. But you yeah, like Penny from Inspector Gadget, like she, she was like the star of the show. She was like the smartest person in the show. I know. I just than- never heard anybody name drop Penny from Inspector Gadget. <laughs> No, she was smarter than Dr. Katz, and she was smarter than Inspector Gadget, obviously. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's kind of, uh, that was like really cool to me when I was a kid. That's good. Smart girl getting some play. You know, uh, but, uh, what about Shaka? Shaka Khan, <laughs> Shaka Khan has always been like, like, she has this presence that is like undeniable, you know. And it was really hard to pick between Shaka Khan and Tina Turner because they all they have this like this almost like godlike presence, you know, like between the two of them. But Shaka Khan just, uh, I'm every woman does so many things for me as a song. <laughs> and it, 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 she's iconic. Uh, she's always like presents herself very well and like interviews and very honest. Um, she still makes like new music. I think her last album came out like 2019, actually, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and she, like, yeah, she's a force. She's a force to be reckoned with. And sure, her voice is just like, it, it's gargantuan. It's, you know, it, 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 there's nothing else. It, there's nothing else you hear when Shaka Khan is singing, you know? 
So like I said, two of them I understand and you went to them first. The other one, I do not get. I've only, But to be honest, I've only seen and heard Renee Zellweger in like Reality Bites and the cinematic masterpiece that is B-Movie. So what attribute of Renee Zellweger would you say makes her like a standout next to Shaka Khan and Jennifer Tilly? Um, I'm pretty sure uh, Bridget Jones' Diary, which is basically like, how, like, like a retelling of, um, was it Pride and Prejudice? Yeah, Pride and Prejudice. You know, it's as far as like Elizabeth and uh, Mr. Darcy, the char- those those archetypes are definitely Renee Zellweger and uh, and uh, Heath Ledger. No, not Heath Ledger. He, Hugh Grant. Who's who, who's opposite? Who's opposite of Renee Zellweger? I think it's movie. Hugh Grant and like yeah. another white guy that's like yeah. a star. <laughs> Colin yeah. Firth. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, but I think like her sense of humor. Uh, is very uh, like the way the way she played that role and the way like her facial expressions are are, are, are presented and uh, like and I think I think just like her all around like, I think Renee Zellweger was the first like celebrity of like that body type that I paid attention to like that you know where it's like not overly skinny but like you know like you know what I mean just like a normal human and a normal human a, new, <laughs> a normal adult human woman who's also happens to be gorgeous you know like you say that was like refreshing to see on screen somebody who wasn't like angelina jolie who was like bam bam you know well i mean it's not something that i thought about because i think i was like in my early teens at the time so like i didn't it was just something that struck me as different you know like this is not like you know like well i think tomb raider came out around the same time so yeah it's not like tomb raider or or uh uh, Catherine Zeta Jones or something like that. You know, it's 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 like very 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 proper but also like very gorgeous at the same time. You know, without being like overly sexualized. You know what? I think you've sold me on her. I've always been like, ugh, Renee Zellweger, but I think you have sold me on your reasonings. So thank you. <laughs> Now I won't scoff at her anymore. Be like, I mean, of course, there's probably people, but, but examples before Renee Zellweger, but like it was definitely like the first time that I like, I like seeing all this like, oh, this is not like an overly sexualized lead woman, you know, in a role, you know, in, in, in a role. Plus, I think Bridget Jones' Diary, I think, is like a unique beast in, its, in itself as a as a rom com, you know, where. Where, where, where like both of the people have like flaws as opposed mm-hmm. to like you know extremely toxic guy goes after you know that woman that just has a job that she really likes <laughs> oh so every matthew mcconaughey movie <laughs> and no, is there kate hudson so um let's talk about jennifer tilly some more so i would say there's a good chance that 90 percent of people who know who jennifer tilly is is because of you know bride of chucky wow Honor and obey. I wouldn't marry you if you had the body of G.I. Joe. That's the movie I haven't seen, by the way. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is disrespectful to <laughs> Tiffany, who is way better than Chucky. She makes the movie. Anyways, I hope you have seen this next movie because it's a classic. It's the 1996 movie, the masterpiece, House Arrest. Have you seen this movie? I have seen House Arrest. I haven't seen it in some years, but I have seen House Arrest. I think it's on Netflix if you want to check it out. So she plays a MILF in that. So what would you have done back in the day if Jennifer Tilly had been one of your friend's moms? One of my friend's moms? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it would have been it, it would have been over all the time. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. Like, hey, man, you, is your mom cooking? We're ordering a pizza? OK. All right. Oh, no, I don't gotta, I don't got to go home yet. <laughs> You know, Did you I, have any friends who had MILFs? Um, uh, probably. Uh, um, no, actually, when you said that, the first, the first thing I thought of when I, when I, when you, when you, when you said that was there was this, uh, woman who I was absolutely scared of down the street. <laughs> and like, I watched this woman, like, like, peel off her big toe because it had an ingrown toenail. She, she had boiled peanuts and poured the boiling water on her foot and ripped off a toenail for bare hands. Like, 
How did your mind go from MILF to this disgusting I don't know, because you said Friends Moms, and that's like the first one I thought of. Oh. That's, the one I, that's the one I spent the most time with, I, I should say. She babysat us, me and oh. my little sister. So. <laughs> Was she okay? Or <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I think so. Like that, that woman was fearless. Like I, I, she was absolutely fearless in my eyes, anyway. Like, like that was that's admirable in its own right. But, um, but yeah, I, I didn't really know my friends' mothers all that much. To be honest, uh, Lisa Torres' mom was was very, very attractive, but she was also like, I think she had like, I think she had like her daughter like when she was like seventeen years old or something. So she's probably like the age I am now when I, when I met her. <laughs> and the younger parents were always hotter. My friend uh, Tiffany had a really hot dad. So I was over at Tiffany's a lot. So let's take a step back from the MILFs and the DILFs and talk about the reality of being a black man right now. Well, the reality that comes with dating and love. Because one of the oldest conversations in the black community is about black men loving outside of their race. Now, Shaka Khan is a strong ass black woman, but Jennifer and Renee, far from that. Have you ever had to deal with any naysayers when it comes to the type of women you're interested in because you're black and they're not always? Oh yeah, yeah I remember, uh... I was at I was at an exchange, which was like a used CD shop, and like you know, I I have an afro and I wear a pick in my hair, and I was with my ex girlfriend at the time. I was with my girlfriend at the time, and this dude was just like being all sorts of rude, and he's like, "Oh, you got that pick in your hair, but you with a white woman," like, and she just stormed out, like she literally stormed out the the store, and like the people at the counter like kicked him out, and they're like, "I'm sitting here trying to pay for shit." <laughs> <laughs> And, so and, they're like, and, and and they're yeah. just, I mean, they just, I mean, they just gave me the stuff because I'm like, uh, like it wasn't you, like it was a customer. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna file a grievance or something like that against the store because some customers are thick. But you know, but yeah, they're like, yeah, they they apologized to me and like you know, like let me have this. Like the, I think I got like an old dirty bastard CD that day. And, but yeah. Isn't it interesting that like if you date outside your race, they automatically think like you can't take care of your hair the way you're supposed to. It's like you can't have braids, you can't have an afro, you have to straighten it. It's like, no, I still have to take care of maintain my curls, please. <laughs> hmm. Well, and plus like there's like certain things you have to take precautions for. Like, like uh, if, if, if I go into dating a white woman, the first thing I say to her is like, like we, we can't argue in public. Like I'm not gonna argue with you in public. We're not gonna yell at each other in public because you because that that looks like something very bad. And I'm not having no stranger call the cops on me <laughs> because we have a discrepancy. We can wait until we get home. You know what I mean? When does that conversation come up for you? Right away. Right away. <laughs> like you're on right. Tinder and like they swipe right and you're like, hey, if we get into this. Uh, if it, 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 on the first date things are going well and we got a second date then and then like yeah pretty pretty close to the beginning is when that conversation takes place like hey like for real like because you have to like i don't know for me i always have to ask the questions of like hey like you know what's the history of like interracial dating with your family or some shit like i like i want to be prepared for those type of things and the conversation takes place usually in, usually in the beginning because like I, I i can't be arguing with white women in public i, I can't i can't do that I totally understand that. My um, my fiance, he is white and his family lives in Virginia and his sister was getting married and that was going to be our first trip together. And I, I was like really nervous because it was like, even my dad was like, you need to call me when you get there. I don't know about these country white people. I don't know. I want to have to come out there and find you. I was like, I think it's going to be okay. But I mean, the husband's side of the family, um, his brother-in-law, I was like a little, like the dad showed up with a Duck Dynasty tie to the rehearsal. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> but it worked out, I'm alive, I'm safe. <laughs> so another thing I wanted to talk about was the idea of putting celebrity crushes on a pedestal. You don't strike me as the type to do that. You seem really cool, laid back. But what are your thoughts about people like the fan from, have you ever seen the documentary about the pop singer Tiffany? Um, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. But well, I can only, I can only imagine. It's when fandom goes from just being a casual fan to obsession. Um, so, so it's like that, uh, it's like that uh, Brody, that Brony documentary that came out. <laughs> 
No, a little less. Well, Bronies are a whole different story. This was like he went to her meet her like like a performance or something, and he was in the audience, and it was like where you think just because you've read their Wikipedia page, you know everything about them and your best friends and everything like that. So what are your thoughts on people who take their fandom and obsession to that level? Uh, I think people who generally like people who, who people who generally use things that they like as like integral parts of the personality. I kind of look at them suspect, you know, cause like, your, what, what you like is not necessarily who you are, you know? It's like somebody who, like, identifies as a stoner. Well, there's plenty of people who smoke weed that don't identify as a stoner. You just, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not a personality. It's just something that you consume. You know you know what I mean? I get so, that. It's like a 13-year-old boy who smokes once, and then he has, like, all marijuana socks. And oh, like yeah, and, like, draws, like, mushrooms on his notebook and shit. And, mm -hmm. like, yeah, like... <laughs> so... We've talked to, okay, so those fans go too far, but let's be real. We've all kind of fantasized about our lives with our crushes, famous or not. So in a perfect world where you're with each, you could be with each of this, these women, what would your life be like with each of them? If you were with Shaka, Jennifer, Renee, separately or together, oh. they could be sister wives, your choice. Oh man, I, I am not maintaining a polyamorous relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that is that is something I am I am not I don't want, even want to try at the, at this point. Uh, but um, I don't know, I'm pretty regular, and I think with Shaka Khan, I think I mean, I'm, what my life will be like is I'll be like, hey, how about how about you get on this track? <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about this one? Come on, <laughs> tell me what you think. <laughs> to be a very musical life. What about Jennifer? Jennifer Tilly. Um, Jennifer Tilly seems cool. Like. You know, like she's like a like an accomplished poker player now. Mm -hmm. I don't think she I don't think she acts that much. I think she does more voice acting now than than actual like live acting acting. And I, I think I think that it will just be really chill life, or like at least that's what I would I, I would guess. You know, people who don't use people who don't like are not like out there like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not out there like that for a reason. You know. And then Renee. Oh, uh, Renee Zellweger, it'll be funny. God, that'll be a funny life to have. I, I, I feel like she has a good sense of humor. I feel like I cannot, you know, she can all right when you don't take her seriously, you know, like, and not to mention she's very, very talented, you know, like I can imagine, you know, like going over lines and stuff like that. And, you know, like, and, 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 and uh, actually like, because I think I'm funny, but I know I'm not Renee Zellweger funny. But I still would be like, "Hey, I told you you're joking. You laughed at it. That means that means I'm I'm also a comedian, right? <laughs> you know." So because you've chosen three, I have to ask the inevitable fuck Mary kill question. Mm. <laughs> I want Mary shot the time. Uh, I want Mary shot the time. Uh, about Jennifer Tilly, and I hate it, but you know, I gotta. Renee Zellberger catches a fade. Oh, poor Renee. <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> so, we're done talking about crushes. I wanna take a minute to talk about your craft, your art, your music. Can you tell us more about your latest release and what you're working on now? Uh, well, my latest release is Ellen the Destroyer. It's just a single that, that I released in. 25th of March. Yeah, it's like a week ago now. Um, but, uh, this year, I'm, I instead of I did three albums last year, and I'm not going to do that much material again in a calendar year. Uh, I decided to release one single a month, every month this year. So I'm working on that project, and those are all going to be collected at the end of the year and released as one as one piece, which is why it's not for sale on the on the label website yet. Uh, I also have another another uh, a sequel to 2.0 that will be coming out uh, probably either early next year. It, it, it'll it'll, be, it'll come out in less than a year. Less than a year. I know that much, but my label is keeps on releasing music, and it gives me new stuff to do. So like, like I think we released like four or five projects so far this year. And it's only it's only about to be April. Like busy, busy. Yeah, it is. It is pretty, it's been a busy, busy year for for Lonely Ghost Records and for me. Um, 
I have some wicked features in the in the in the pipe. I got yeah for for the the summer hat the summer the summer uh, end of the singles release is going to be pretty uh the probably some of the most expensive songs that I've ever done because are like, working I, with label mates or new people coming in. Uh, well, I, I don't want to jinx it, but I do have. I, I have a track sent to uh, Lazy Bone from Bone Thugs and Harmony, Ooh. so we'll see how that Fingers works out. Fingers crossed. You know, so yeah, yeah, that, that was a cold email. That was a surprise response. I did not expect to hear back from their management at all, so. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, it, 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 was, it's a, it was a great exchange, too, because uh, they hit me with, you know, what they, what they can, what they want, which, you know, it's Lazy Bone, he's valuable, mm -hmm. you know. He could ask for whatever he wants, basically. And I'm like, okay, I can't do that. And I'm not going to insult you by counter offering. So you guys have a nice day. And they're like, well, what can you do? Because I sent them the track in the first email. Mm -hmm. So they so they heard the track. <laughs> and that's part of like the sneaky shit that I do. I, if I, I sing you the track first, and if you like it, you're going to want to get on it. Mm -hmm. But if you just, if I email you with nothing, then you're, you're more likely to say no to me. So... <laughs> Very good strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very, yeah. I learned that. I learned that the the, the hard way. <laughs> but yeah, and they and they came back to me. It's like, okay, well, this is what we can do. And it was like fifteen percent more than my original, uh, more than my original price. And I was like, okay, I, I can do that. And well, I, I should have that track back in about two weeks. So we'll see. We'll see how that how that happens. But yeah, I should have a track with Lazy Bone, which would be which would be amazing. I, I, I would have worked with a platinum selling artist, so that, that, that'll be, that'll be nice. And plus, like, it's like a hometown hero. It's Cleveland, Ohio. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that, I'm so excited for you. That's really cool. I didn't expect to get such an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think you're the, only, you're the first person I, I told about that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fingers crossed. I'll be like, oh, sending positive vibes. So, oh, and I also have a podcast as well. I just recorded an episode yesterday, and I'm going to record another one tomorrow. Uh, what's Tell it with Alan. Uh, it's Telling with Alan. Basically, we go through like we go through song by song on an on a recent released album with the artist, and we ask questions uh, pertaining to each uh, each song on a record and the record as a whole. You know, it, it's it's interesting. I th we started this. You know, to actually like compensate for not having like liner notes for mm -hmm. you know for digital releases because that's mostly what we do now is digital, like for Spotify or just having the files downloaded. But mm -hmm. you don't get the liner notes with that. So, Talent with Ellen is a uh, is basically to compensate for that. That's really cool. It's a really interesting idea. I didn't think about we don't get those kind of those notes anymore. Yeah, when I was a kid, I used to read those all the time. Like go over them and like a new world shit was recorded whose publishing company was <laughs> was associated with it you know like yeah i used to go through those all the time and especially being a musician now like well I'm a musician in, in quotation marks I, i am firmly the worst artist signed to lonely ghost records oh no uh you're working with bone thugs you know <laughs> i mean yeah i mean i'm i'm in a label of great people so but, but yeah, uh, things are moving this year. Things are like the label's busy. Uh, the podcast that got started like in last December, in which I fell into it, it wasn't even like a planned thing. It was like just, oh, like it's December and nobody's writing because it's December. Mm -hmm. And I just came up with 3.x that month. And so, so we did that <laughs> to, to do it. And it just became like a regular thing, you know? So kind of like an evolution of what you do because you said to me that you want to always keep moving forward when it comes to your music you never want to sort of have the signature sound or style and in, in order to accomplish that uh have you been going to new places for inspiration switching up your routines changing eating habits like what kind of things keep pushing you forward in your sound uh i think well now now i do more playing than sampling uh, now, like I have, like I have a lot of songs where I'm just absolutely just like going for chord progre chord progressions now, as opposed to like sampling things. And eventually, I want to marry those two, those two uh, schools of composition together. But for now, like I have like 
some really good like trancey stuff and like house stuff as opposed to like the sample stuff that i that i normally do like the 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 the, the ghost themed records the 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 phantom the pantries those are all always going to be sample based records because you know that's what the, that's what that tradition is but you know i have a lot more stuff where i'm like playing live now and it's really really interesting i'm learning a ukulele actually and that's uh yeah, stringed instruments are weird. They 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 are, they are really weird. They definitely make you look at building things like like differently because it's more uh, it's more vibey. Whereas like I look at music like Legos usually. Like you need a bass, you need the you need a foundation, you need you, like you need to make this house perfect, and you know like all the carpet and shit, and like that's usually like you know like the fancy stuff. You know that's how that's how I look at building a song. I look at it like building a house and. Uh, learning ukulele you have to like start out with like the the color of the walls and then build around that that's how i see it mm -hmm. and it's 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 interesting it's interesting uh it's, it's interesting learning that and how it how it influences you how you you know build songs is this your first stringed instrument that you've learned very first one and like i because i don't know how to read music <laughs> you know like I'm, I'm learning a lot of things at the same time with this like the, how i got into music was through brute force like it wasn't through <laughs> education it was like through force of will you know mm -hmm. that i wanted to when i wanted to do this in fact i don't think i ever told anybody this before but like i think it was 2005 mm -hmm. maybe 2004 i first heard little brother uh they're they're uh they're they're a hip-hop trio out of uh rally i think rally north carolina and um yeah, Rally in Winston Salem, and like they put it out there that like their producer Knife Wonder uses Fruity Loops, and I downloaded that as like a 14 year old with like a CD crack and everything it was pirating this software, mm -hmm. and and that's where I made my first first like songs with, and I posted them on MySpace Music, and like that's what got me into making uh, making music, like when I was when, yeah when I was like a freshman in high school. Was it just because you liked that record and you liked how it sounded? So you're like, well, I'm going to download this and I'm going to try to do it too. Well, yeah, because like you, you, you like something so much and you're like, oh, shit, all you need is this and you get it. And it's like, OK, there's something way more to this than you're, than, than, than you're getting out of it right now. But it's still pretty cool. It's still like you want to learn more about this and how this is like done, you know, like it's. And it's, that's like half my life ago at this point, more than half my life ago. And man, and I still use I still use uh, FL Studio to this day. I've gotten away from it and I've came back to it with a whole lot more knowledge and, and a whole lot more uh, like, like education of how things are mixed and everything. And it's it's definitely good to come back home to FL Studio after spending years like trying to get away from it and away from it. From date, from that first day when you downloaded that software to now, what would you say like the biggest lesson you've taught yourself is about music and creative creativeness? I, I think um, the the hardest lesson to learn was that if you like, you're not going to become more valuable by wanting to become more valuable. Like the only way that you're going to become more valuable, like as far as like your talent goes, is if you spend time with it. As long as you spend time with it, the value will always go in an upward direction. You know, no matter what, it will always go in an upward direction. And that's something that was hard for me to grasp. Like when I was younger, because I'm like, because you're like, you start out, you're like, oh, how come I'm not an underground hip hop star yet? You know, you know, <laughs> like, so that that's one thing that, because that, I, I used to like want to be a writer and things like that. and. Like, it's just like having people say your shit sucks. It's like, okay, all right, I'm not gonna do this anymore. You know, whereas like music, I was too shy to share it. So I, I didn't have that problem and I just kept on doing it. And I think, yeah, it was just like, I, th I did not think to think that I was getting more valuable as time went on. You know, cause I, I would quit. I would, I would go for periods where I quit for like two years. I wouldn't do a thing for two years. And, you know, and but I always found a way back to it and the things that I learned when I get back to it are things I could have learned like two years ago you know what I mean mm -hmm. so yeah as long as long as you keep at it keep on like you know taking of new things like there's a lot of things that that music has taught me like I wouldn't know how to build a computer from scratch you know if if, if I wasn't you know 
making music. You know, it's just you know you, you tinker with things, you build you build different synthesizers and stuff like that. You buy new equipment and you mm -hmm. just by osmosis get to know how things kind of work and how electronic signals work. And I'm pretty sure it's similar to writing. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure there's some intrinsic things you learn around writing that mm -hmm. that, that that are that you don't necessarily expect to learn. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're always learning with each new type of uh, thing you write, whether it's you know personal op-ed or you're just writing a simple list about Disney characters. You know, you're always going to learn something new. What about oh, yeah. the podcast? Where can we find that? Uh, the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, the podcast is on uh, Lonely Ghost is the uh, YouTube uh, YouTube uh, page. Uh, you'll find that at YouTube.com/slash Lonely Ghost Rex. Um, I, I suggest uh, the, the YouTube. Uh, we do have an anchor as well, which I don't have the link for that, but I prefer uh, I prefer the the videos, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. So, Lee, Nelson B, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about your three celebrity crushes. Everyone, you can find Leave Nelson B's information below. And until next time, keep crushing it.